Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies Stroke. Today we're going to talk a little bit about how to manage stroke as part of the Nursing Emergencies Program. First of all, let's talk about the different kinds of stroke that occur. The first is an ischemic stroke. That's the majority of our strokes. And then there are hemorrhagic strokes. As the images show here with a ischemic stroke, what we have is a thrombus or we have an emboli that is blocking part of the circulation. That blocked circulation then causes ischemia, injury, and necrosis to the area of that injury. On a hemorrhagic stroke, on the other hand, we have a blood vessel that has burst for one of many reasons, and that rupture of the blood vessel then allows blood to leak out into the brain tissue or into one of the spaces around the brain that may compress the brain and cause additional injury from that hematoma. So let's start out with our strokes here and take a look at how they line up. So you have a patient present, you think the patient is possibly having a stroke, what kind of stroke could it possibly be? 70% of them are caused by atherosclerosis and are thrombotic in nature. So 70% of them, the vast majority, will be thrombotic and from the atherosclerotic process, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Another 20% are embolic. These emboli come from the heart, typically a patient who has atrial fibrillation, and the atrial fibrillation is causing a stagnant blood flow uh, that is sitting in the atria that then allows clots to happen and the clots get thrown to the brain. The third type we have is hemorrhagic and that's the type where we have the bleeding that's occurring in the brain. So let's move into these a little bit more. So the ischemic type of strokes occur because we have the atherosclerotic process occurring. Now remember, we talked about this with acute coronary syndrome as well, that we go through this process of ischemia, injury, and necrosis. When blood flow is decreased to an area of the brain or of the heart in the case of acute coronary syndromes, we have ischemia occur first where there's not enough blood flow to allow enough oxygenation of the tissues, and they become ischemic. During that period of time, they're not working properly, but if we reapply that oxygen to that cell, then the cell will probably, in most cases, recover. However, there will be a point in time when the lack of oxygen has caused so much damage to the inside of the cell that the cell is now going to burst and that's when we get into injuries and how injuries occurring now if this is only like five little brain cells it's not going to be a big deal but if it's five million brain cells then we're going to have a real problem uh, with our patient having symptoms lastly we end up with necrosis so the Cells themselves may become injured. Some of them may recover somewhat, or they may just be able to be removed and be replaced by healthy cells. However, when we get to the point of necrosis, now we have dead tissue that is in the brain or dead tissue that is in the heart if we're talking about acute coronary syndrome. Now that dead tissue is dead, it's not coming back, and eventually it's going to be replaced by scar tissue or fibrotic tissue of some sort. So it's not going to be functional tissue that is going to be helpful in being able to conduct electrical impulses and be involved in our brain processes. So let's take a look underneath that arrow and we see what's happening with ischemia, injury, and necrosis. With the ischemia and the injury components there is what happens with a TIA. In the past, we always thought that TIAs just involved having decreased blood flow to the brain and that there wasn't any long-term damage that occurred to the brain. What we found out is that there is long-term damage that occurs to the brain by doing PET scans and other types of scans of metabolism. We're able to find areas of the brain that become injured during a TIA. However, that area of injury is going to be replaced by an area of the brain, or in other words, the functions of that area that of, of injury, will be replaced by another area of the brain that is able to take over for the function of the area that's been injured. In which case, the patient's symptoms will resolve. If the injury is large enough, 
that the patient is not able to regain function, then we call that a stroke. The necrotic component of this process is definitely going to end up with having long-term dysfunction and stroke. Transient ischemic attacks, so again here's our TIAs, this is the point in time where we're having just some ischemia or injury. Characteristically, lasts about five minutes of dysfunction and usually resolves within about 15 minutes. However, we'll give it up to about two, three days, 48 to 72 hours for our symptoms to resolve as other parts of the brain take over the function for the part that has been injured. Remember, there could be long-term damage that occurred to that area. So we definitely want to follow this up because if there is a blockage or a slight blockage in one of these vessels, then we want to make sure that the patient is having some changes in their diet, having some changes maybe in their medications, etc., to try to prevent additional injuries from occurring. So the etiology is atherosclerosis, as we mentioned earlier. Arterial obstruction could be a possibility or arterial inflammation. Those are other theories of why we have transient ischemic attacks. Uh, there really isn't a definite Thing that we can point to and say this is what causes all TIAs. So in some patients they don't have a lot of signs of atherosclerosis but instead they still have a TIA. So that doesn't make a lot of sense and some of the theories are that we have some kind of arterial obstruction that's occurring or arterial inflammation that is occurring and then resolves. In ischemic stroke, and if you notice the risk factors here, we're getting back to that idea of atherosclerotic disease. So we have the lipids that are starting to form on the wall of the blood vessel. And by the way, they think that this occurs or this starts maybe in our early 20s. We have some kind of infection and the infection makes the blood vessel walls irritated, which then allows lipids to collect there. Well, those lipids will, and then foam cells will start to appear in that area, and they form this little fatty streak. The fatty streak starts getting bigger over time because it's disrupting the blood flow. Over a long period of time, other things will start to grab onto that fatty streak and start to make it larger, and eventually we get this fibrofatty plaque and then a complicated plaque at the end where there's calcifications and there's a necrotic core. That necrotic core is what keeps that thing getting bigger because it keeps that inflammatory process going in that atherosclerotic plaque. So cardiac disease, previous TIAs or CVAs, we want to be watching for as possible risk factors for the patient developing an ischemic stroke. Atrial fibrillation obviously would be important if we're looking for the patient having an embolic stroke. Treatment for ischemic stroke includes a whole variety of ways to be able to restore blood flow. All of those things that we've learned about the cardiac patient and restoring blood flow to the heart, now we're applying those same things to the brain. So thrombolytics, anticoagulants, of course, even after we use a thrombolytic, we need the anticoagulant to try to prevent the patient from developing a second clot. Angiography, in this case here, it's showing a patient who is having an angioplasty and stent placement. We can do those same kind of things in the brain that we do in the heart. And that may be necessary if the patient has an isolated area where they have a thrombus that has occurred as a result of atherosclerosis. The bottom line is we need to balance our oxygen supply and demand. So when we're thinking about the brain, it doesn't necessarily mean we want to give oxygen. Remember, there's an area of the brain that is at least ischemic and may be injured or necrotic. When that happens, it creates inflammation. Inflammation develops oxygen-free radicals, and oxygen-free radicals cause additional secondary damage. The more oxygen the patient has, the more oxygen-free radicals are produced, and the more secondary damage occurs. So we don't necessarily want to give oxygen here, but we can decrease the demand. The demand of brain cells is regulated by how much activity they're doing. So if we can get that patient in a calm room. This is why they turn to dim the lights down and try and keep the room fairly quiet, etc. So there's not a lot of demand, not a lot of activity of the brain, so that we try and decrease demand. Uh, when we're using a tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, 
we have our plasminogen over on the uh, left hand side there that is going to change into plasmin and this is where our TPA works it changes that into plasmin which then is going to cause our fibrinogen and fibrin to lyse the clots and help to break them down and that way hopefully we'll be able to break those clots down get rid of them and we'll restore blood flow so using TPA, uh, there's a lot of uh, controversy about this. Our neurologists love it because it leads to better long-term outcomes. Our emergency guys don't like it quite as much because there is that chance, and it's a fairly significant chance, maybe about up to 5%, that patients will have some significant bleeding, GI bleeding, a big brain bleed, etc., as a result of giving TPA. Well, you know, if you've got a patient who already has this ischemia injury necrosis that is occurring in the brain, we have vasculature that is going to be, because of the ischemia, it's going to be rather fragile. And now we're giving some TPA in there, it could cause that fragile vessel to burst and then it won't clot. So that kind of leads us to the idea of the bleeds. So 10% of our strokes are caused by having a bleed. This bleed can come from a variety of different sources and occur in a variety of different areas. So let's start on the left side of the diagram and work our way around here. We have over on the left side an epidural hematoma. This is occurring above the dura. Typically this is arterial, oftentimes happens in the temporal area as a result of an injury to the temporal artery. Because it is arterial, it'll tend to form faster and under higher pressure than other types of bleeds. Over on the right-hand side at the top, we see a subdural hematoma. Now we're down below the dura, but between the arachnoid membrane and the dura, so it's still well encapsulated and could be easily removed. Both the epidural and the subdural are fairly easy to remove in many cases. Subdurals are typically venous. They'll happen over a longer period of time and in fact could come in a variety of different sources depending upon how big that vessel is. If it's a very large blood vessel, we will have an acute subdural. It'll happen very quickly. If it's a smaller blood vessel, we could have a subacute subdural that occurs over a period of days. And then we could have a chronic subdural if it's a very small vessel that occurs over a period of weeks to months. Lastly, we have our subarachnoid hemorrhage down there at the bottom. Notice it's down at the bottom toward the base of the brain. Now, this is because these are usually the result of having an aneurysm that occurs in the circle of Willis. There's lots of bifurcations that are occurring in that circle of Willis, so there's lots of area of stress that could end up causing an aneurysm. That aneurysm bursts and we have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, it's below the arachnoid membrane and between the brain tissue, so it may be fairly easy to remove. Some subarachnoids, though, will disperse kind of along that membrane and be much more difficult to try to remove. The brain doesn't like blood. Remember, there's that blood-brain barrier, so any kind of blood that is touching the brain tissue is going to be very irritating. There are multi-system effects of having an increase in intracranial pressure. Any of these types of strokes will potentially increase intracranial pressure as a result of swelling or as a result of bleeding in the case of our bleeds. That increase in intracranial pressure will stimulate the sympathetic nervous system to, in an attempt to try to raise blood pressure to maintain cerebral perfusion. However, that Stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system will also increase acid production and cause stimulation of the heart. So we could have EKG abnormalities, and you see some of them listed there. When you take a look at those EKG abnormalities, T wave changes, ST elevation, Q waves, doesn't that sound like an MI? So we'll have to be careful in assessing that patient with these EKG abnormalities if there is also an increase in intracranial pressure and we'd want to use some GI prophylaxis to try to prevent GI bleeding. Our prompt action for a patient with stroke will be to try to get oxygen to that tissue that is being injured so that hopefully we can limit the area of injury and hopefully the patient can have the best long-term outcome. So oxygenation is important. We want to balance the supply and demand Cerebral perfusion may be increased by using thrombolytics, 
long-term anticoagulants, maybe even angiography to go in there and do an angioplasty or stent placement. Hyperventilation is a temporary method of decreasing intracranial pressure. By decreasing our CO2, it'll cause vasoconstriction in the brain and hence will decrease our intracranial pressure. It is, however, temporary. The brain will get used to the lower CO2 level and the patient will eventually, that's, that intracranial pressure will start going back up again. Steroids may be helpful. Uh, in most cases, steroids are most helpful for the spinal cord and less helpful for the brain, but they still may be used in order to try to decrease the swelling. Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic to help to decrease some of the swelling in the brain, and we want to decrease our metabolic activity by decreasing that patient's brain activity as much as possible. So our takeaways, time is brain. The longer the period of time before intervention, the greater the chance that patient's gonna have long-term complications. Most strokes are ischemic, so we should be looking for that ischemic, look for those risk factors, look for the ischemic type of an injury. Look for atherosclerosis, considering our imaging and prompt intervention to try to restore blood volume and blood flow as quickly as possible. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Emergencies Stroke. Please join me for the rest of the Nursing Emergencies program to learn more about how to manage nursing problems in our acute patients. Well, thanks for joining me again. Until next time, 